my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page physics adda i'd like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar and today it's our 54th international physics webinar so good evening to all here in bangladesh and a very good morning to all those who are watching this program live from usa so hope you are well and uh, safe from corona pandemic so uh, all we are uh, uh, experiencing a new new experience uh, so uh, with with the corona pandemic situation so uh, we, we we have to adjust ourselves with this new normal situation so we cannot continue our normal academic program inside the campus so we have to start online program to continue our academic program so our department department of physics pabna university of science and technology has already started uh, our uh, online program including uh, online classes and online international physics webinar so i'm happy to share with all of you that uh, we have already successfully completed our 53rd uh, international physics webinar and today it's our 54th and today i'd like to welcome you all to a joint session between pabna university of science and technology and the department of physics california polytechnic state university usa in uh, uh, solar electric cooking so we have uh, with us here today dr peter schwartz professor department of physics california polytechnic state university uh, california usa connecting with us uh, from usa through online and he has already connected with us so uh, good evening sir and good morning to your part so welcome to our international webinar and welcome to our university and bangladesh good morning thank you yeah and uh, i think uh, this will be your first collaborating program with any bangladeshi university isn't it sir uh, pardon me uh, is it your uh, first collaborating program with any bangladeshi uh, university that's correct yes that's oh, correct great. okay so thanks for accepting our invitation so i would like to uh, say thanks on the behalf of the department of physics from the university of science and technology so we have a an series of webinars and in those uh, webinars physicists from different countries are coming as a main speaker in our uh, international physics webinar and they they are delivering their experience with our uh, student and they are they are sharing their uh, knowledge with our student and i think by this way our student are benefited and uh, uh, for those who are new i would like to uh, inform that the main aim of our international physics webinar is to uh, encourage and motivate our student in this corona pandemic situation and uh, we have uh, divided our webinar into three parts first i would like to introduce our speaker with all of you and then our speaker will deliver uh, his piece and at the end we have a time uh, at that time anybody can join with us and uh, you can also ask question by commenting so you have already come to know the title of our today's uh, international physics webinar and the title is solar electric cooking starting companies with a global learning community and our speaker is dr peter shorts uh, professor department of physics california polytechnic state university california usa and uh, if we uh, see his educational background you can see he has completed his bs degree in physics in 1986 from mit and uh, his ms degree in 1993 in plasma physics from princeton uh, princeton university and uh, his phd degree in 1998 from uh, princeton in surface physics and postdoctoral research scientist uh, from northwestern in university in 1999 to 9, 2000 so we can see uh, his professional experience uh, we can see uh, from 2017 to present uh, he is currently uh, working as a full professor at the department of physics uh, the this university uh, and uh, we can see his uh, from 2007 to 2017 uh, he is working as associate professor at the same university department of physics and from 2006 to 2007 uh, he worked at the university of california at berkeley in energy and resource group uh, for a sabbatical study for sustainability uh, technology and policy and uh, in 2003 2007 he also uh, worked as a assistant professor at the same university department of physics and uh, from 2000 to 2003 he worked the same university at the department of physics as a lecturer and from 1992 to 2000 he worked as a post doctoral research at northwestern university so he has also summer uh, 1998 to 1999 as a collaborative research at uh, columbia university 
and uh, also 1998 to 1998 at Colodora College, at the physics department, visiting assistant professor. And in 1993 to 1998, uh, he worked as a Princeton Material Institute, Princeton University, University for a PhD graduate student. And in 1991 to 1993, uh, he, 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 he studied in Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Princeton University as a graduate student and research assistant. And in 1989 to 1991, uh, he started. He worked as a uh, Barkersfield High School as a physics teacher. And in 1986 to 1989, he uh, worked as a United States uh, Peace Crop Fiji South Pacific High School science math teacher, science head of the department. Uh, and we can see his uh, teaching related activities. We, we can see he has a lot of uh, activities and uh, uh, we can see his uh, different grant, internal and external grants. Uh, he got uh, several grants from different organizations. And uh, uh, he, he gave different uh, presentation in different organization and in conference and other places. And uh, he has some uh, patent. He has, he has already applied for some patent. Uh, for his work so thanks for for all of your patience now it's time to go to our uh, speaker so i'd like to welcome you again sir so it's your time you can start your session sir thank you very much thank you for having me pritam um so So in 2015, my students and I created a new way to cook, whereby a very simple way to cook, where, whereby a solar panel is connected directly to a pot to cook. So why would we do this? Well, about half the global population still cooks over an open fire with a lot of the problems. We have about 4 million respiratory deaths per year from breathing the indoor air pollution, the emissions from these fires. That's more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. That's one death about every 10 seconds. And also through these open fires, we're turning all of our, nation, or all of our world's forests into global climate change gases, exacerbating climate change. Also, a billion people in the world still don't have access to electricity. <clears throat> And lastly, because solar panels have become so incredibly cheap that now is the first time that we can actually afford this, that this is such an inexpensive cooking technology. And so we connect a 100 watt panel directly to a cook pot. And the reason it's only 100 watts is because it's very inexpensive. They retail for about $50. But you say, look, you can't cook with 100 watts because the pot won't be able to get hot enough because it will be losing that heat to the environment. And so we immerse the cooker in insulation and we calculate this insulation has the insulating factor of about 10 Celsius per watt, which is the same as about 0.1 watt per Kelvin. And that means that if we have a difference in temperature of 100 Kelvin, uh, yeah, 100 Celsius, so if we're cooking at 120 Celsius, we're going to lose about 10 watts to heat. And so if we have an insulating factor like that, we can get very hot. Now, how did we get here? I didn't start with solar panels. For almost a decade, my students and I built <clears throat> large solar concentrators. These Scheffler concentrators are 2000 watts. There's my little girl explaining at a festival how they work. And they're big and lovely and very effective at cooking. And then we said, OK, we need to make them cheap because these are expensive still. And so we're surfers in California and we decide, oh, well, we make surfboards out of fiberglass. So why don't we just lay up these big dishes in fiberglass and make big concentrators like that? And it was all going very well until I saw this. I was like, holy cow, when I was a kid, a 100 watt panel would cost $10,000 to make. And now a 100 watt panel costs $20. And sure enough, you can buy them in bulk for 20 cents a watt. So solar panels are now 
the least expensive way to generate electricity, and it's still getting cheaper. And I think it's probably going to be the least expensive way to cook in the near future. And so in 2015, I said, look, let's just hook a solar panel directly to a heater and insulate it. And my group, in three days, they built our prototype. In three days, and we went off to Solar Cookers International and had this festival and tried cooking. And it was great. And so one of the reasons for doing it this way is there's such a beauty in no moving parts, right? We don't have a big, um, a big concentrator that has to move and also location. We don't have to cook outside. In fact, I'm cooking right here at home. These are the so three solar panels on my roof, 300 watt solar panels. I can make three solar cookers. Where does this go to? Well, look, the Pritam can change this. They go up. Those solar panels cook. Let me see if I can hook this up so I can see where we're going now. Um, if we look up in the corner of my house, we see these wires come right down. Now, can you make that big, Pretam? Can, yeah. I can see. But, uh, so blow that up. And I'm in my kitchen right now. And so here's my solar cooker right there. And we can cook something. We can open this up. And there's the pot. And we can jump in some oil. And maybe I want to cook some tofu and onions. So we throw them in and listen. You can listen, this works pretty well. And we'll fry those guys up. And then we'll put this cap on it with a vent. And just cover it up again and let it cook for a while. I can check the temperature. The temperature was at 160, and now it's gone to 102. So it's dropped down, but it's creeping back up again. And so, because of the convenience and the lack of expense, this is an ideal way to cook. And I started cooking at home, which I am now. We tried all different methods. There's my little boy with um, an insulated pot inside there with the wires connected to a solar panel. And we started cooking right away. Chicken. We made our own heaters rather than buy these industrial heaters right here. We made our own heaters with nichrome wire and concrete. A group of four students in 2016 went to Uganda and uh, implemented two solar cookers, just two trying them out. And the people there said, we don't like how yours look. We're going to use reeds because reed is prettier. And so this one was very happy with her solar cooker. And we published this in development engineering with a lot of student authors. I'm so grateful for the work the students did. Um, and so we can look at what can you do with 100 watts? So we know, here's my equation, folks, you physicists. Um, power is the rate of change of energy. And when we heat water, the energy changes mc delta t. So you check my math on this. I'm asserting that 100 watts is enough power to heat about one kilogram of water to boiling from room temperature in one hour. Okay, so with this, you can bring one kilogram of water to a boil in one hour. Means in the course of a day, you can cook about five kilograms, five kilograms of beans, enough food for a whole family. And so this slow cooker works very well, but people don't really like that so much. They don't want to cook slowly. I want to cook quick. And what if I want to cook at night? I can't cook with your solar cooker at night. So we want to invoke phase change thermal storage. We want to store that energy. So now our new method is instead of heating the food with the solar panel, we directly heat 
a material that stores that energy. And then later we can put the food in and heat it really, you know, hot. And so the material we use is erythritol. It's a sugar alcohol that's reasonably inexpensive. And so we call this unit our phase change assembly, the PCA. And the material is the PCM, the phase change material, which is erythritol. And we can look at erythritol and, for instance, compare it to water and see that they're very similar. Um, water is much nicer because it has a higher specific heat. And we'd love to use water, but, well, we've got this freezing point problem. We like erythritol because it freezes at about 118, which is a great temperature to cook. And so we did an experiment where now what you're looking at is this is the temperature uh, at the, uh, let me go back. We have two thermal couples. One is in the pot with the water that when we add water, and one is at the bottom of the phase change material. So you can see through the course of the day, six hours, we heat these up. This is the bottom of the phase change material. And this is the cook pot. It gets very hot. And then I turn it off after six hours and it thermalizes and slowly the temperature drops down because it cools even through the insulation. And then after three hours, so we heat for six hours, we let it sit without any heat for three hours. And then after those three hours, we dump in a kilogram or a kilogram of water, I forget. And now we see the temperature of the water shoot up pretty fast and come to boiling in about half an hour. The phase change material comes down to the boiling point or the melt melting point, and it keeps giving heat until all of its heat of fusion is used up, and then the temperature begins to drop. And it's through this change of temperature, this rate of change of temperature, and this rate of change of temperature, that we were able to measure the um, resistive coefficient of our cooker to be about 10 one-tenth of a watt per Kelvin difference. And so we took this phase change thermal storage to Ghana and we made one of these in Ghana in a small village. And in Ghana, every evening is the most beautiful sunset you've ever seen. We loved it. We met Martin there, a graduate student who's come to the United States and is working with us now. And we made a whole bunch of different kinds of cookers. We implemented two, being very careful not to fall. And so we can look at how we make these. We see here we have some corrugated aluminum to increase the thermal conductivity. And this is the molten uh, erythritol. And so this is when it solidifies. And we can put the phase change assembly in some insulation. Now, this is a hard part to make because you have to glue a flange onto a pot. But now in Ghana, we have a company that's making special pots for us with the flange included. And this is what I have in my kitchen. Here's a molten erythritol and all of the electronics are on the outside and we slide that right in. I put three struts so that this supports itself in the insulation. And this is a vent so that the, um, the liquids can um, be, um, so that the liquids won't condense on the inside. Okay, and so, Pratam, uh, if you can, I'd like to uh, add some food now to my cooker and see how we're doing. So I'm gonna go back again, if you can make that big so everyone can see it. Can you enlarge that? Let me go back. And we see everything's cooking really nicely. Those onions are cooked. And I'm gonna throw in a whole bunch of food now. We've got some uh, potatoes and beans and garlic and celery. And we just slam that in. And the temperature is going to come down of my material. That's all right. Ooh, 
we'll put this back on and let that cook. Okay, so we've got a good cooker that works. Um, let me make sure I can see myself here. I, uh, pardon me. Yeah, there I am. All right, excellent. So we got a good cooker that works. How are we going to get people to use it? And so we know what the general conventional method of dissemination is. I get a technology, I patent it to protect myself financially. I approach a large company and we make kajillions of them, leveraging economies of scale, and then I ship them all over the world. But we don't know how these are gonna work in different places. And so we're gonna try a very different method. We have all open source technology online. Everybody's welcome to take it. And we're gonna work together to make a global learning community where everybody learns and helps each other. And I actually have a little bit of money to subsidize people to start up. And we already have partners in India and Africa and are looking in a few other places. And so we have this global learning community that we get together every week. Students at Cal Poly, Hawazin in India and people in Africa. And we share ideas and we learn together and we build ISACs and we cook. And these People in different countries are also building small companies and are going to be building these just like I did in my house and making a small business and maybe a big business. Why would we do it this way rather than industrially? Well, in these low income communities, which is where we want to make these, uh, salaries are very inexpensive and resources are cheap. So we're going to save money. Also, when we have all these different people over the world with different customs and different resources, we're going to learn much faster than if we're just one laboratory learning by ourselves. And lastly, if we're selling these things in an area, why not support their local economy by sending the money to those people and building businesses locally? And so we're having a great time with this. And um, a lot of the resources are centered around our website. And so you can go to our website and get involved. And let's just take a look at the website. If we go here, we see our Solar Cookers International. And you see here, Martin actually lived with my family this summer. We taught him how to surf and make guacamole and we made solar cookers. Um, and you can, for instance, go and see videos that we explain how this works. Like, let's take a look here. So, Evan, what do you think? It's good for deep frying. It's good for deep frying. Yes. 2015, we introduced insulated solar electric cooking for ISEC. So, all the resources you need to learn more. And we have these construction manuals. Let's take a look at how to build the ISEC with phase change thermal storage. Now, this is a living document. Our global learning community is constantly updating it and improving it. And what you have is like this video that I just showed you, um, diagrams on how these work, and all the different things that we, um, that we need to build them with the links, for instance, No, here is the plug that you might want to buy if you wanted to buy that plug. And the diagrams and how we put this all together. So for instance, this is how we make the heater, our resistive heater. Get the leads, crimp them with copper tubing, glue it on, put an aluminum foil over it. Now, this is just the way I made mine or my students made one of them. And as information comes in from our learning community, we're going to, uh, to improve that manual.
And so let's be a little more practical here and uh, talk about some of our problems that we've had. You know, how long will this erythritol last or how hot can it get? Supercooling is a real problem where the erythritol doesn't crystallize. And some other things like we could use diodes or resistors. Let's take a look. So Nick Dunning over the summer experimented with recrystallizing the erythritol. And 150 Celsius works great, even 220 Celsius. But we start to get caramelization and uh, degradation when we get much hotter. So 200 Celsius is a good temperature. And we try not to go over that. Now, the other thing is supercooling. This has been a problem. So what you see here is when we added the water, the erythritol came down to its crystallization point and released that heat of fusion while the water was boiling. It doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes this happens, whereby when we add the water, the erythritol goes way below the heat of fusion. Uh, I'm sorry. The erythritol goes way below the crystallization temperature of 118. It dropped all the way down to 80 and then stayed right at the boiling point of the water. And only after a period of time, actually almost two hours, something happened and it began crystallizing. And so during this time, our power was significantly limited because of the supercooling. And here I had a student that was Nick again, cycle the temperature hotter and hotter and hotter and here you see the, uh, the erythritol melt, get hot, cool, and crystallize. But it doesn't crystallize immediately at that temperature. We get this supercooling down well below the, uh, the crystallization temperature. So we can control it to a degree. If we add graphite, the... Um, the supercooling temperature that it goes down to is not so low. And we also are working with composites. We put shredded aluminum in. Aluminum does two things. It increases the thermal conductivity so we can more quickly get the heat from the phase change material. But also the shredded aluminum provides a whole bunch of different uh, sharp points and provides nucleation sites for the crystallization to take place. And we're also thinking about what if we do mixtures? What are other sugars we could add? And these are directions that we want to go in. Now, a little bit more interesting is here is a cooling curve where I just turn the heater off overnight. And over the course of 25 hours, I let it cool. And we would expect the erythritol to come down and then at 118, we would plateau while we release the heat of fusion. But we don't, it goes down to 92 or so. But then we see something very interesting. These are two different temperatures of crystallization. And sometimes we only get it to go to 105 and then it drops. Sometimes it goes to 118 and then it drops. And sometimes we get both and we see that this crystallization speed is slow because the temperature comes up slowly over the course of an hour. But the 118 crystallization temperature is much faster. It's more abrupt. So one, we don't know how to control that we get supercooling. We don't know how to control whether we get this lower temperature crystallization or the higher temperature crystallization. And we're going to be exploring that. I've never seen this crystallization temperature published for erythritol anywhere. So we just found that out. Also, I've never read about a substance that has two crystallization temperatures. And so scientifically, this is exciting. And the academic, the researcher in me wants to be quiet and do the research and publish it. But actually, I really want, what we want is we want to cook. So we want this problem just to go away. So I say to you, the international learning community, is help me figure this out. If you can figure out how to prevent this supercooling and how to control which temperature we go to, I'll be very grateful. Just contact me. Okay, so there were a couple of other things we wanted to do, and that is 
How do we thermally connect these pots better? We want this pot to fit so snugly into the PCA. But the problem is you can't buy a pot with another pot that's one millimeter smaller. So what we do is we buy two of the same pots and we stretch it. First, we anneal the pot, right? And we show that if you take an unannealed pot and an annealed pot and push them, the annealed pot is much softer. And then we take two halves of concrete slabs that we put in there and we pry them apart and the pot stretches just a little bit, enough to fit very snugly inside. So that works great. Now, I also wanna talk about, I've talked only about resistive heaters, but for a good year or more, we just use diode heating, where we take a string of diodes with a, you know, 0.7 voltage drop, and we wrap them around a pot, we epoxy them on with JB Weld, a high, any high temperature epoxy, and then we cook with them like that. You say, why would I go with diodes rather than a resistive heater? Well, the thing is for a solar panel, a 12 volt solar panel has a maximum power point tracking voltage of about 18 volts for all solar intensities, right? And diode voltage will remain constant at that 18 volts. So you'll be able to draw power from a solar panel at all, at all solar intensities at the same voltage, at, at the maximum power point voltage, optimizing your power draw. But a resistor, the voltage changes proportional to the current. So as the current drops, as the sun begins going down, your voltage drops and you lose efficiency. Let me show you. So here, are, these are data that I took from my solar panels on my roof. And there's a small change in voltage because in the evening it's hotter or at noon it's hotter. And so the voltage slides in just a little bit. But mostly we see at noon or 1 p.m. Um, the current is very high. And as the sun goes to higher, level, uh, higher angles and the intensity drops, we just see the, vol the current provided reduced. <clears throat> and so if you have a resistor, V equals IR, what's going to happen is the, oh, pardon me, the, the power is current times voltage. And so it's going to be the area of the rectangle defined by the working point on the power curve or the current voltage curve. And so that's where the current voltage curve of the solar panel meets the current voltage curve of your load. And so for a six amps, 18 volts, we want a resistor of about three ohms. And so here is your your linear curve for a three ohm resistor. And so you see, we get 100 watts at, uh, at noon, but at, um, at 5 p.m., the current drops and so does the voltage. And so now I only have 16 watts that my solar panel is delivering to my cooker. However, if we had a diode where diodes um, are going to keep a constant 17 volts. This is my operating point. And so I have 17 volts times two and a half amps or whatever, and that's 37 watts. So we find that we have much higher power under um, reduced sunlight if we have diode heaters. And so the other thing we can do with diodes is, um, is we can use them as a voltage control. And so we have the solar panel and we have the diode heaters. Now this is all connected to your pot and that's getting your food hot. But at the same time, you could pull off five volts to charge your cell phone with the USB charger. And you could pull out four volts to charge a lithium ion battery 
the, for your lighting system in the evening. Now, that's not what industry says we should have. Industry says you should have a 12 volt charge controller, charge your 12 volt battery and keep it there for, for evening. And then you have a voltage converter to your lighting system and your cell phone. And then you have an inverter that goes to your uh, induction cook stove. And so this is more convenient, but this costs about $10 plus a solar panel. And this costs about $150, much more expensive. It's out of the price range of very poor people. Also, you're gonna have to spend an extra 50, 60, $70 every year on a new battery. And so this diode system is very nice for having constant, for optimizing power connection to the cooker under all solar conditions. And so this is the idealized chart I showed you. Um, these are our experimental data. And so you can see it's pretty close. It, diodes are not a perfect straight line. As the voltage gets higher, the current increases exponentially. And you also see that as the cooker gets hot during the day, there's a shift to lower voltages. So there's some hysteresis. So this is the voltage curve in the morning when the cooker is cold. And this is the voltage curve in the evening when the cooker is hot. And so there's a lot of good reasons to use diodes instead of resistors. But we're going with resistors. And the reason, the main reason is because um, with diodes, you have a lot of electrical connections. If they get too hot, they do break. And there, there's a benefit in that because if they break, they prevent your cooker from starting on fire. Um, but they, these connections can corrode. There's a lot of, so construction, for construction, these resistors are, are very, are, for construction, the resistive heater is easier to implement. And so our solution is, why don't we just electrically control this? Um, with a buck converter, we can, um, let's go back here. With a buck converter, we can take the voltage at the maximum power point voltage of our solar panel and we can convert it. We can drop the, the voltage down and increase the current and access a higher working, uh, a higher power point on the resistive load. So we can start from here and shift to this point. And with the same resistor, we can still get 37 watts, or we can still get optimum power. And so, um, and so we're gonna put in a power optimization device to shift these voltages and get the same power, but there's all kinds of other electronic things we like to check. But wait, let's take a break and check out our food here. And see how we're doing, Pratam. If you can, if you can make this. How are we doing? How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing great on time. Okay, so if you can make that big again, so people can see it. And we see things. Oh, it smells good in here. This is pretty nicely cooked. It's ready to. Well, let's check the potatoes here. Are the potatoes soft? Can you see? Oh yeah, they just they just break apart. Looks like it's ready to eat, Pratab. Oh look, there's a lot of water in there. Now what am I gonna do with the water? You know what I do? Is I usually just add some rice. Hang on, let me get some rice. Try to figure out how much water I see in the bottom there, and I add the right amount of rice. Uh, this will work, okay? And so we'll just mix that in. 
And, uh, you know, if you don't like this, I'm not putting this out here so you can get the recipe. This is just the way I cook. And that's one of the things about the learning community is everyone's going to, everyone's going to use this the way they like to cook the food they like. So we'll let that sit for a bit. In about 15 minutes, the rice will cook, I'm sure. And I'll go back to my PowerPoint. Um, so what we need is we would like to have a phone charger. We would like to be able to control the temperature so that we can dial the temperature. We'd like to optimize the solar panel uh, power. So we want that buck converter. And we also want to be able to connect to the grid because a billion people don't have electrical power, but about 3 billion people or four, three and a half billion people still cook with open fires. So that means there's a lot of people cooking with open fires that have access to grid electricity. So the different things you can do are have a power optimization device that has a sensor on here and you have feedback control. So you can control the temperature of the ISEC. Also, the solar panel um, normally is only connected to the resistive heater, but we could also in parallel connect a 12 volt power supply. And I have to confess that I'm using one of those, right? Um, it's, you know, the power supply is right here hooked up here. And so the 12 volts provides about uh, 35 watts to the solar, uh, to, to, to the cooker, right? So it doesn't heat it a lot, but it's enough to keep it warm overnight because you might've wondered, wow, Pete, uh, you're cooking at seven in the morning. How did that thing stay so hot all night long? So it got really hot yesterday. And then during the night, just that 30 watts was enough to keep it up to cooking temperature. So, I mean, I'm about done. That's what we got going on. But I think it's very important. Part of our learning model is, you know, I, I have a lot of classes that I uh, instruct on poverty mitigation or finding, um, finding collaborative solutions to humanity's difficulties. So I'm a physics instructor. I teach F equals MA like other physics instructors. But half of my classes deal with sustainability issues and equity. So what are we going to do? How are we going to work together to, uh, to build a better tomorrow? And so I've had, you know, well over 100 students, probably close to 200 students, pass through these classes and do research projects with me. For instance, two years ago, this group of engineering students built the very first thermal storage device. And in the class, different students are always building stuff. And I say, oh, you know, if you think they look good now, they look better with their safety glasses. And here are a bunch of solar cookers, uh, ISECs that they built. Uh, this is the group that went to Uganda. And uh, here is Martin and Emmanuel and Buzz Kirk, uh, the Ugandan graduate students that worked with us. These are the graduate students, uh, the, I'm sorry, the undergraduate students at Cal Poly that worked in quarantine this summer, all of them individually at their own homes. They built their own solar cookers. And there's Martin who lived with me this summer and uh, worked in our laboratory. So I hope I've given you a good idea about what we're doing. And uh, I look forward to any communication with you. We're still looking for collaborators that wanna work with us. And I'm very interested in answering questions now. Thanks, Pratham. Should I stop my sharing? Yeah, yeah, thank you, sir. So uh, we have actually, uh, we have some problem in technical problem. So my Facebook page has uh, disconnected. Oh, no. So uh, 
yeah yeah so uh, that's why students maybe firstly they join but later uh, now uh, the, the the program is going in uh, youtube so okay so i think uh, as the video will stay remain uh, i think anybody can join later uh, sorry ask later question so we can discuss later and we have uh, one guest so if you allow then we try to connect with uh, him let's see so porosh can you uh, connect with us can the students come back that left Did I wake up? Did you just get up? So uh, okay. So do you have any question? Or do you have a, do do you have any question? Do I have what? No, 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 not you. Uh, so we, we have a guest. So I just asked uh, him question. So thank you, sir. I'm sorry for this problem. So I haven't uh, experienced this type of problem uh, previously. Uh, this is the first time. So for it, so sorry for that. So uh, I got some. So one question from uh, our guest, uh, Mubdul Hassan. Uh, I had some question, but unfortunately my PC system is not working. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, so, sir, so thanks uh, for your uh, wonderful session and uh, thanks for accepting our invitation. So we are, we are very pleased and uh, happy that uh, you accepted our invitation and uh, we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Public University of Science and Technology. And uh, as uh, we face some problems, so uh, in the near future, we'll arrange another session with, with you, sir. So uh, I'll, yeah. I, I'll, I'll solve the problem and we'll, we'll, we'll arrange another session with you. So thanks again. And, Thank you uh, very much, Vietnam. It's been a pleasure. Today. And, and the, the video will remain in YouTube. So if anybody asks questions, we'll discuss uh, of that uh, later. OK? So thank you. Uh, so got it. Uh, bye. Right. bye. bye.